Hello everybody, welcome to Insight. Today we're going to be talking about Mozart, Haydn and Tarek O'Regan's music. And to accompany that, Tony is going to make us a drink called a Boulevardier. So this drink is essentially the same as a Negroni, only we use whiskey instead of gin. Nice uh, sort of spring into warm weather uh, drink that still has a little bit of body to it. So the three main ingredients are whiskey, uh, a sweet vermouth, and some sort of bitter liqueur. And uh, each one of these, the choice that you make on each of these will impact the, the ratios. So we're gonna begin with a little bit of bitters. I'm gonna use some orange bitters, maybe just about a dash per cocktail, a very light dash of this cherry bark vanilla bitters. And then again, per cocktail, one ounce of Campari. In this case, one ounce each per drink. Probably my favorite whiskey right now, um, Willet Rye Four Year. This one is about 109 and change proof. And then let's give that a good stir for about 30 seconds. Some people use a cherry, a maraschino. Um, we're gonna do an orange peel for the garnish. I love the smell of the bitterness of Campari. Basta così. We are. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. It's pretty strong. <laughs> yeah, very nice. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Cheers. So this week we have a great program, two classical composers and one living composer. We begin with Tarko Reagan's Rye, followed by Haydn's Symphony No. 95 and Mozart's 25th Piano Concerto in C major. And uh, Tarko Reagan is very special to us this season. We're premiering a piece that we commissioned from him. World premiere is at the season finale in June. Um, but the piece that we're playing this week is an existing work. When did you first get to know this piece and, and, and what really took you toward it? I heard this piece that we're playing this week, Rye, a couple of years ago when I was conducting the Halle in Manchester and they were also performing this in another program. Mm. But I've known Tarek since 2002 because he was one of my teachers at university. Mm -hmm. um, he's English, but his mother is Algerian and his father is Irish. So he has a very interesting kind of um, set of identities. And he also lives in America now. Rai is a word in Arabic which means opinion, but it's actually a kind of hold all for lots of different kinds of popular music. Um, it can mean folk music, it can mean folk pop music, it can mean folk mm. rock music. And Tarek draws on that tradition to write this piece. Mm -hmm. um, in his program note for the piece, he describes rye as a kind of Arabic equivalent of American blues, a music that's all about alienation, poverty, emancipation mm -hmm. from colonial leadership, that kind of thing. Right. Um, but because the genre is so wide, rye music today could just as easily be influenced by Edith Piaf or Latin American rock music, mm. East Coast jazz or Madonna. But it does have a couple of characteristics that are always there no matter what's happening. And some of those are pitched hand drums. So drums that actually have a pitch instead of just a sound. Right. Um, and rhythms that are repeated that either go with the beat under the music or else deliberately rock against it. Mm -hmm. So in this piece, it's written for a relatively small orchestra with a percussion section right at the middle that features a couple of these um, goblet drums that are that are familiar in Persian and also in Arab and Turkish music. So you'll see a very large yeah. percussion section. And then, like I was saying before, there's repeated rhythms that sometimes go with the beat and sometimes go against it. And the whole piece is constructed out of those 
characteristics sort of clashing against each other. It doesn't sound though like Moroccan or Algerian music. He's not trying to write something that's based on folk music. It's just yeah. taking those inspirations from his own culture and writing something completely new. Yeah. What? Are, how would you describe his treatment of uh, of harmony? Um, his it's very approachable tonal harmony. You know, neo tonal. Um, there's a lot of jazz influence in the way he puts chords together. It's very attractive music. And yeah. the reason why I wanted to to um, play this piece this week was that when I heard it in Manchester a couple of years ago, I instantly thought this is the kind of bright, accessible, approachable and enjoyable music that people would enjoy here. Right. Um, so I'm hoping that it's going to be a really nice introduction to his music before we hear the new piece that he's written to accompany Beethoven 9 in June. Yeah. And and this is actually, uh, you know, bright and and lively and accessible. That kind of describes Haydn's approach when he moved to London during the point of his, in his career when he wrote this symphony, mm -hmm. his 95th, out of 104, which is a staggering uh, catalog when you think of it. But um, his method of composition, or maybe his his language, somewhat changed because he was composing to a different audience than he was in in Germany. Right. What was different about his audience in London? than what he had been experiencing on the continent. Well, in 1790, Haydn's patron, Esther Hauze, died. And all the years before, Haydn had been employed as the Kapellmeister at the court, um, mm -hmm. Esther Hauze's court in Austria. And he was required to write music all the time. So he was employed and he was busy. But when Esther Hauze died in 1790, some, suddenly Haydn was free to travel. Yeah. And the empresario, Salomon arranged for Haydn to visit London in 1791. And Haydn brought 12 symphonies with him written specifically for that period. So he knew that he was going to be performing to large audiences of cosmopolitan people in bigger concert halls in the Hanover Rooms in London instead of the court where he'd been mm -hmm. so far. So that meant that these London symphonies, as we call them, the 12 symphonies, tend to have a slightly more public um, demonstrative character. Populist, if Populist, you will. Yeah, yeah, if you like, compared to the previous ones. Mm -hmm. So this week we're playing number 95, which is the third of the 12 London symphonies. And it's unique for a couple of reasons. It's first of all, the only one in a minor key. Mm -hmm. um, so it instantly has a kind of different atmosphere. It also doesn't have a slow introduction. So the piece begins with this very stark, slightly anxious sounding theme that begins the whole thing in octaves in the orchestra in unison. And from there, the music kind of bumbles along, but doesn't stay in C minor for very long. Haydn isn't really exploiting the kind of weight of possibility of the darkness of that key the way Beethoven would later in, right. in the fifth. He's, he begins in a, a sad mood and then very quickly shifts to C major, and mm. most of the first movement actually is very optimistic. The second movement is a set of variations in E flat major and has a really beautiful cello solo, which of course is a great thing for us to play here when we yeah. have such a wonderful principal cello Alexei Romanenko. Then the third movement goes back to the darkness of C minor for a minuet, a very happy trio, again with another cello solo. Um, and then a finale, this time completely unabashedly in C major from the very beginning, a rondo on a very optimistic theme. But Haydn treats it fugally in the finale. Um, and he must have known Mozart's Jupiter Symphony, which was written a few years later before. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps he's trying to have a go at what Mozart achieves in that symphony with the same kind of ecstatic counterpoint that the Jupiter Symphony has. Yeah, it seems to be that uh, composers, as they, they neared the, the latter parts of their career, kept going back to the counterpoint of their Baroque, Bach especially, mm -hmm. uh, predecessors, to show you know, what they were capable of in, yeah. in, in construct constructively. That's right, and of course, Mozart had a very big impact on Haydn. We forget that Haydn, although older than Mozart, lived long past Mozart's yeah. death. And he really felt the pressure from this young composer who was writing so brilliantly. Yeah. Um, and I think that that really pushed him to push himself and his compositional craft even further. Yeah. Interesting because the this rare symphony in a minor key, um, the last time we had a Mozart piano concerto in January, we had Conrad Tau playing one of the few piano concertos that Mozart wrote in a minor key. This week we're back into uh, major, but this is like every Mozart piano concerto we're doing this season. Completely unique, has its own unique voice and 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 timbre. 
in some ways, it's one of the most unique of all of his piano concertos, and so much, so much so that it may have been so ahead of its time, and it and it sort of fell out of fashion for over a century before it was performed again. Um, but his his C major, uh, Kirchhoff 503, and we also have Jonathan Biss coming back, who was here a few years ago mm -hmm. playing, who is one of the absolute masters of early uh, late 18th century and early 19th century uh, piano. So what do you find fanciful about this piece and what do you find um, unique and that gives it its own voice? One of the reasons that we wanted to play five Mozart piano concertos this season is that for me, the piano concertos of Mozart summarize the mastery of his composition more than any other genre. You think of what, what makes Mozart Mozart. It's the combination of the dramatic brilliance of the operas, mm -hmm. the melodic beauty of his writing, the sense of contrast between different groups. We think of the wind music um, in operas, the way singers are put against each other. There's always an element of contrast. Um, all those things seem to reach their pinnacle in the piano concertos. It's like he's at its very best in yep. this genre. Um, and for me, 503 is one of the most sublime combinations of all those elements. Mm -hmm. This is our fourth out of five. Um, we've got 503 C major, which for me is the, the king of the piano concertos. Mm -hmm. And then in a few weeks we have 488, which is the queen, mm -hmm. the A major. <laughs> um, so these are, we've saved these, these best two for last. It begins um, maestoso, majestic, very much kind of martial music with trumpets and drums in C major, which is a very typical key mm -hmm. to, to represent militaristic things. Yeah. And one that he loved. One that, yeah, that's true. But almost as soon as we get that majesty of the opening, we get this emotional doubt, C minor creeps in, and that gives us a sense of vulnerability and of an artistic mm -hmm. personality dealing with emotional strife. So that's mm -hmm. very interesting in the first movement. Also, it's one of the most beautifully orchestrated of Mozart's concertos. The wind writing is amazing. And something which I want to say a lot more is that um, our wind section at the moment is just so fantastic. Mm -hmm. We've had all these years Absolutely. of loads of people moving and new people coming in and lots of change, but it's really stabilized over the last couple of years. And the wind playing this season has just been absolutely amazing. It really is. And um, I mean, the C minor concerto a few weeks ago was just, it was so joyful and beautiful. Yeah. So that's something that's really going to be highlighted in this concerto as well. And I'm very excited about that. Yeah. Um, the second movement is an andante and it's quite an objective kind of calm oasis amidst the first and last yes. movements, which are both very emotionally engaged. The yeah. second movement keeps its distance. It's very elegant. It's very refined. It's not getting too caught up in the drama. A little it's very of, of the era of this classical period. Yeah, it, it's um, a moment of repose in the mm -hmm. middle of the drama. Mm -hmm. And then the third movement is a rondo, one of Mozart's catchiest little tunes, dum, da, dum, da, dim, da, dum, dum, um, that comes back many times. Um, but typical of Mozart, Mozart is always so strong in his sense of the form, in the sense of how the music fits into the shape of his movement. And that gives him great individuality because he's so secure in the form. Mm -hmm. One of the things that happens halfway through this movement is that a completely new melody, which hasn't been featured at all so far, bursts out from nowhere. And it's a melody of incredible beauty. Um, the French composer Olivier Messiaen, the 20th century composer, said it was the most beautiful melody that Mozart had ever written. Mm -hmm. And that gives this wonderful sense of depth and a feeling of the sublime in the finale, which makes the concerto very special. <laughs> and as Tony said, we're welcoming back Jonathan Biss, um, one of my favorite pianists of, of, of his generation. Um, we played Beethoven fourth concerto, excuse me, Beethoven second concerto here a few years ago. Um, and it's great to have him back. Jonathan is a very wonderful player. Um, his, his playing is full of life and uh, emotion and thought, but he's also a really kind of heavyweight cerebral interpreter. He's recorded all the Beethoven sonatas to great critical acclaim, and he brings that kind of intellectual power to Mozart as well. So 
very excited about having him back. Yeah, and, and what, one thing that I admire so much about him, and you alluded to this, is that just it's it's an amazing combination of that cerebral approach and and thoughtfulness with just a, a very still human connection with the instrument. It, it's not rigid Dry, yeah. by any means. So mm -hmm. he's a he's very powerful. Um, can't wait to have him back. Well, it's a very exciting program. Another one that you put together that is wonderful, and we have another wonderful soloist coming in. So we hope to see you all there. It's gonna be the 8th and the 9th at 7.30 p.m. in Jacoby Symphony Hall. Get your tickets at jacksymphony.org. And looking forward to seeing you. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.